Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this EMG virtual event on how to embrace B2B media's accelerated digitalization. My name is Robin Wires, and I'm the head of editorial here at the marketing communications firm EMG. And today I'm very happy to welcome Chris Smith, who is the editor in chief at AMI magazines, and our own um, CEO, Ricky Weevo. And I think it's going to be a really vibrant discussion on how B2B media is really changing and what's needed to get your message across nowadays. So just before we start our discussion, I wanted to draw attention to a few specifics for this session. So for the length of this event, you've been placed on mute. And Chris and Rick are going to first be going through a range of topics before we open up the floor to questions. We'd really love to hear some from you. So if you have any specific questions for our speakers today, please just write them down in the question function and we're going to go through absolutely as many of them as possible just to yeah to really get the whole views of the marketing communications world and really how things are going to apply to um to b2b media so with that i'd like to hand you over to uh, rick and to chris thank you very much hi everyone i'm ricky vivo i'm ceo here at uh, emg uh, my background is really um, trying to help companies as fast as possible getting through their digital transformation when it comes to marketing, communications, technology, and the commercial benefits thereof. Um, and I'm really excited to be uh, joined today by Chris Smith. Um, those that do not know Chris, um, he has a long background in uh, in the trade media, especially within uh, plastics, so very industrial um, manufacturing. His um, his suite of uh, of uh, magazines uh, at AMI are born digital, and he understands very well how to get the right message in front of the right target audience. So he's the right one to talk to about uh, how um, how digital media has accelerated within B two B communication. Welcome very much, Chris. Maybe you can introduce yourself as well. Thank you, Matt. Thank you very much, Ricky. That's a very nice introduction. So uh, I'll just uh, I'll just briefly um, give a, a little insight into into my background, expanding on what you were saying there. Um, basically, I graduated in material science. I studied polymer engineering and postgraduate level. Um, worked in the plastics industry for several years before deciding that uh, publishing was something that interested me. And uh, so I moved into the, public, into the publishing sector. I've been working in publishing now for 30 years, almost most of that time covering the plastics industry, but not exclusively. And I've worked for some of the leading global um, publishing companies in the, in the plastics and B2B area. Um, I've also, been involved in conference um, organization and I've chaired, I lost count how many conferences I've chaired, but <laughs> way more than 100 international conferences. Um, moved to AMI around about 10 years ago, um, largely, well, exclusively to work on their digital magazines. And uh, AMI had always been a company that I had looked at because of its data. Uh, everybody knew that it had good data. And when they decided to launch digital magazines, that really appealed to, to, to me because I had been working for print-based companies and I had seen the struggle that they were having trying to integrate digital into their business. And the opportunity to start at ground level with a purely digital magazine business was very appealing. So that's, um, that's me, I now manage um, five process specific uh, fully digital magazines covering compounding, injection molding, pipe and profile, film and sheet extrusion, and the most recent one, uh, plastics recycling uh, from a technology perspective. So that's me. Thank you so much, Chris. So you're the right person to speak to today. Um, what we have really seen over the last couple of months, I would say is a, um, big acceleration of um, the need that organizations see for, for use of digital media um, in, a, in a world where uh, suddenly 
trade events, which was one of the favorite ways of getting in touch with your uh, with your audiences, and face-to-face -face meetings uh, have turned into what we are at today, which is uh, uh, on camera. Um, suddenly, um, both sales departments and communication departments uh, have struggled to accelerate how do they actually reach, uh, reach the audiences. And we have seen a big growth in uh, in that need, how do you accelerate it? But I was wondering, uh, when in terms of your offering at your magazines and what you see from uh, the audiences, um, any growth there as well? Um, well, yes, um, we've seen. Uh, it's always very, very, very difficult to um, assess the growth in a magazine business because obviously each magazine. You know, some have a different feature profile to another, so some get more readers, some get fewer readers, just month by month anyway. But um, our perception is that there's that there has been an increase in the amount of uh, the number of people and the amount of time people are spending looking at the magazines. So that we think is uh, is certain. But obviously, for us as a business, um, you know, we were already a fully digital publishing company and we've been doing this for 12 years now we uh, we have something around half a million page views every month through our magazines and we've got more than a hundred thousand subscribers so um across all five uh, magazine titles so it's not really a situation where we think people have said, oh, I need to get my information digitally. I'll go and look for a digital magazine because a lot of people are already using our magazines anyway. Um, but yes, we have seen a, a small, uh, a modest, no, I'd say a modest increase in, uh, in viewing. Um, I think also we, won't, we don't just have the magazines available on, on the web. We have app editions as well. And it's uh, similar there. App, app editions are more difficult to track. You would think they would be easy being digital, but the people who created the app system didn't really think about it from a publishing <laughs> perspective. So they're not actually not. that difficult to track. But again, yeah. I mean, we, we've we've had um, over 10 years we've been publishing them now, and we've got 80, approaching 80,000 downloads now for those app editions. Uh, app, app, that's the apps, not the magazines within them. So that, that's an awful lot of people that have downloaded it. And that, continu that continues um, now. And we're seeing you know, a good solid number of downloads still. So pretty much, yes, we, we seen, we've seen some uptick. But we're, we think that we're probably seeing less of it because we're already so digital, if you see what I mean. If you speak to somebody, if you speak to people within the more broader uh, trade media um, there I think they would pre probably see a more of a move to digital if they're a print based publication I mean uh, when we when we started publishing we were pretty much the only people putting digital editions of uh, onto the web now exactly. most publishers yeah most, most publishers now most print publishers have some form of digital edition um, but they tend to run it more as an add-on and I, I guess they're probably seeing more activity um, there than we perhaps would be particularly because this isn't anything that's just relevant to the to the plastics media this is trade media in general but traditionally if you have a print publication you send it to the companies uh, or the, the subscribers company so it goes to their business address and obviously yes. with so many companies um, shut down and people working from home. That's not really been something that's possible, whereas an email address will go to wherever you access a server from. So it's, um, yeah, I think I think probably the broader, the broader trade media has probably seen a bigger move to digital than we have because we've already made the move, if you see what I mean. Yeah, and I also know you have a pretty uh, big webinars coming up, uh, especially in uh, in plastics. Is that correct? Um, well, we're, yes, we're we well, we're doing we are yes. <laughs> For the, the benefit of people that don't know AMI, I'll just probably need to explain what our business is because it's not really very 
typical of a publishing company. Basically, AMI was, it's now, I think, approaching 40 years old, but it was originally set up uh, as a consultancy company. And so we had uh, the two founders and some other people doing plastics industry consulting work and specifically focused on the processors. And so they built up a database of processor sites and people and whatever. And gradually over the, over the years, they've um, built onto that data. And so they moved into publishing processor databases. They ran into conferences. Um, various different things and the magazines is the most recent part of what AMI does. Um, but everything that we, everything the business does is based on the databases that, that, that have been compiled over 40 years. Um, with the uh, event side of our business, obviously we have been affected just like everybody else has because all of our exactly. events are face-to-face -face events. Um, and so, yes, we've been looking uh, into running virtual events, um, which is not quite as simple as people initially expect. Because it is not. You can, <laughs> <laughs> the technology is not complicated, but there are a lot of things associated with it that are a lot more complicated. And I think some of the things that you don't initially necessarily think about are, you know, how you structure an event, how you market events, how you price events, and, you know, they're just the way that the whole thing runs. Um, so we're looking at it from that side. Um, we're, we probably, um, we're, we, we've just started to roll out some of our conferences. We have a series of three, um, and seminars running over the over the next month, which looking at, at looking at the plastics industry um, and how it's responded to the pandemic. That's including some of our own global research in there. So we're on, on polymer supply, on business sentiment, things like that. So they're running plastics and the pandemic. It's called. And I always have a snappy title. Um, <laughs> so we're running that. But also, we're seeing a lot more interest from customers, clients yes. on webinars as well. And we're doing, um, we are doing some work there, but again, a little bit different from what most people think of when they um, think about a webinar. I mean, the traditional approach is that someone comes up with a webinar idea, present, you know, they have a presenter speak, they market it either to their own customers and prospects, or they'll go to a uh, a magazine publisher, um, I won't name any, but there are plenty of them, and they'll pay <laughs> to use their email lists to yes. promote it. But we, um, AMI doesn't, you, doesn't make our lists available to third party companies anyway, but what we are doing with our webinar offering is not saying, um, we'll just mail everybody on our list and if they want to join, that's great. What we're doing is exactly the same as we would do with any other event that we're running, which is to focus it on the people that are interested in that area. And it's uh, it's, a, it's a different approach, and it's been it it's been well received so far. We have a number of people try trying the, the the process out, but they're they're basically on demand webinars. Then we're creating a sort of a library of them. People can go in, pick between them, choose them. Yeah, and I think that's what's interesting for our audience today is that, that it's about finding the right subject and, and then really get it to the right audiences. The wider you make a, a, a uh, any kind of live event, the less relevant it will be for the audience, mm -hmm. right? And, uh, and uh, I think the idea of, of starting by a piece of research that becomes kind of the, the, the base of your event is, is really good. What's, what's, what we're seeing is there's a big difference between events that are face to face and that are on the screen because face to face you're normally in a big hall people are there for two three days they're kind of a captive audience for the keynotes mm -hmm. and the, for the booth we're here we all uh, and i bet the audience can go and get a cup of coffee if they want and then uh, uh, then miss parts of it. So, uh, so instead of it being captive audience in space, uh, suddenly people can just uh, leave off. So it requires something more, uh, which we're really trying to uh, 
to help companies with. Um, do you find that during this time that we are seeing uh, companies trying to uh, promote um, like subject matter experts internally, that they are trying to to tell publishers like you, we have people on our side that really would like to speak with you and would like to be part of these uh, webinars, or has that not changed uh, during the last couple of months? Uh, no, I think it probably has changed. I think because, as you said earlier, the, the, the restrictions on face-to-face, -face, the restrictions on visiting movement, all that sort of stuff, uh, it does mean that um, many companies are looking for alternative ways to exactly. reach customers and potential customers and one of the ways that they are looking at is we call it placement where where somebody will write a, an article on a particular topic and then they'll say you know would you be interested in publishing this it's written by whoever it is you know, jane smith or whatever and you know and she's going to talk about x y or z um, and it's a, you know, it is an effective way of putting that company's name in front of people for a, a soft sell is probably a good way. So we get a lot of that. But for, uh, for us, um, for us as a magazine, it, 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 it's not a case that we wouldn't accept an article on that basis if it was, a, if it was very, if it was very much in line with what we were covering. Then we then we would consider that, but most of our articles are are researched by ourselves, and we we speak to five, ten different you know players in that area, and they're a sort of a combination of uh, new technology and market trends. So why people are developing whatever you know that's our style, and so uh, it, it's not something that we're taking up in a big way. But it is certainly something that we're seeing a little bit more interest in. I would, if, if anybody is thinking of doing that uh, <laughs> and incorporating that into their marketing, I wouldn't want to dissuade them. Um, but it is always, you know, it is really, really, really worth looking at what that magazine that you're approaching does and try and make sure that what you're offering actually fits into their business model because otherwise you're wasting your own time and you're wasting their time and it, it's not a good it's you know it's not a good way to go so just do a little oh, bit of research before you start and uh, and that you know that's that's great that you know that's great it's a, it's a sensible well, thing to do i think especially in the trade it has to be um real it has to be authentic and it has to be um scientifically um um yeah um yeah, fact checked. You you absolutely have. The, you can't just name someone as a subject matter expert uh, within something uh, very complex, and then it's going to happen. It requires a lot of work from uh, from the companies. Um, I have another question for you. Uh, we have seen uh, companies being a bit hesitant in the beginning of uh, the pandemic uh, when it comes to what messages they were to put out in the market just because of um, the clutter that we saw in a um, in China that was a February time frame uh, mm. like on uh, into Europe it was uh, March April um, have you seen the same thing that there was like a dampering of the messages coming out for, from the different organization and has that changed now that we at least Europe is uh, is a little bit more under control um. Well, certainly, the the information that we were getting from companies that were doing things like ramping up production of particular products and stuff like that, yeah, I mean that very much followed the <laughs> followed the <laughs> pandemic wave, if you want to call it. Yes. So, um, I think there was um, there probably was in the in the in the early stages. I think there was a little bit of a probably a bit of an element of companies not wanting to look as if they were exploiting um, the situation. But I think as it became clear that the pandemic was a much bigger um, yeah, there was much bigger scale than perhaps people initially realised. I think. I think I think businesses were a little bit more confident of being able to say, look, we're doing this without everybody saying, ah, they're just trying to, you know, 
sell some more product, they want to make themselves look good, which I mean, obviously, when you promote your business, you're aiming for a positive effect. You know, that's obvious. That's, you know, you wouldn't do it otherwise. Um, but I think, um, I think as, as the scale of it emerged, I think people came a little, became a bit more confident of being able to say, look, we're doing this, we're doing this, we're doing this, without, without the fear that they were just trying to get a, you know, an edge over their com competitors. So, yes, we, we have seen that change. Um, and I think that is continuing to change now as well, because obviously the pandemic has changed. You know, we're moving again to, you know, there's different phases. You know, it's gone lockdown, not lockdown, ease up, whatever. And, exactly. and now people are starting to look look ahead to what might happen in the autumn um, if, you know, if we get this uh, second peak. And we're seeing people telling us more about what they're, planning to do in a longer term, shall we say, to ensure that if more protective equipment is required, for instance, there'll be capacity to do that. So yeah, the messages are changing a bit. And um, so we have seen a, a change in, for example, a subject matter that was very, um, very much in the, in the industrial um, uh, messaging before the pandemic was sustainability. And, uh, and then in the first couple of months of the pandemic, it died down for the same reasons that you are saying. Everybody was, uh, you know, trying to help changing their productions into uh, uh, into helping on PPE equipment or hand sanitizers um, and helping each other. And then we actually have seen an increase in the last um, in the last uh, couple of months in sustainability where where this becomes a subject matter again, uh, maybe because um, we have um, we have companies that might have a little bit more time to think about what is our uh, the sustainability message and our sustainability platform going forward. Is that something you have seen as well, or is there other subject matters that you have seen uh, now there's coming some increase to? No, I think, um, I mean, sustainability, I think within the within the plastics industry, I don't think there's really been any any change at all in the in the the view of sustainability and investment and all that sort of stuff. I mean, sustainability is a big issue. It's a critical issue for, for the business. <clears throat> I think obviously, as you said, other other things became a little bit more important. Um, for all of us. We did see a few. Sorry. Yeah, for all of us. Yes, yeah, we did see a few. You know, there was there were the coverage of things like bag bans being suspended and things like that, which made quite big headlines, particularly in the sort of non-specialist, you know, in the mainstream media. But I think really those, I mean, they were just like blips brought in by convenience, should we say? Um, yeah. the, the 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 there's no suggestion. I mean, certainly within the EU, there's no suggestion that things like the single-use packaging di uh, directive would be thrown out of the window because of the uh, of the COVID um, situation. So, yeah, we, we, we've seen it. We've we've seen a sort of a change in the in the level of exposure. But I don't think the underlying interest is any different. No. And um, if if you were sitting on the other side, um, like you were an organization and you were looking forward, um, not having been in uh, much of a digital space when it comes to communication, um, what would you advise organizations to do going into a, a Q3, Q4, maybe 2021 and, and, and uh, in terms of their digitalization? What? I think, um, I mean, in in this day and age, digital should be part of everybody's uh, communication strategy. Um, it's not a, it's not an easy area to work your way through. That that but digital should certainly be part of the strategy. And I mean, in the immediate term, the opportunity for face to face. 
um, meeting will, will certainly be diminished. Um, um, with um, some of the major trade shows, for instance, um, you know, the bigger the, the bigger the show is, the more difficult it becomes to manage social distancing and that sort of thing. Um, some shows are going ahead. Some shows probably won't won't go ahead or will be delayed further. But again, I mean, that will depend very much on the on the show and the space, and the number of people, and all that sort of stuff. But Either way, um, the opportunity for face-to-face -face will be reduced. And so digital becomes very important. Uh, even traditional um, print advertising ha you know, has a value, but I think you know, there is a difference. Obviously, the key difference with digital is that lead generation. When you, when you take a print advertisement, um, your, you know, it is brand awareness. You do, there's all various, there are very various things that you get from it. But the one thing you, that you don't get from it is a direct, uh, direct uh, lead, uh, and you can get that from the digital um, options. But you need to make sure that you're um, expending your efforts in the in the right areas. I mean, an, an example is. Um, um, Facebook. We don't really do a great deal on Facebook as a business. We do. I can imagine. We do some. We do some stuff on Facebook, but you know, there's there's a billion plus people that use Facebook on a regular basis, and um, our estimates, you know, as as a business, we think there's probably globally there's probably less than 250,000 plastics processing sites. So 250,000. Out of a billion, you know, it's um, you're, you're you're fishing you're fishing in a very big pool. Um, it's more important to direct your efforts to the sort of places that you'll find your customers. Um, so LinkedIn is an example where absolutely you have a better you have a better chance. Although even on LinkedIn, it, 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 LinkedIn is showing signs of becoming a bit Facebookized these days. You know, with people people put in their um, personal and political views on there rather than remembering that they're working for an organization, which uh, is not always a good idea, I don't think. <laughs> no, and we, we see it more and more, right, that, uh, that, that the, the ask right now of uh, organizations from to their, to their sales departments and also to their, their communication departments is how do you link the two? How do you link your marketing communication efforts, your content marketing efforts, and how do you see what leads come out of the, in the other end, which is why um, yeah, we're talking to you today as well, Chris, because we're very much uh, helping companies to make sure that they reach the right audience, not the billion on, the, on, the, on Facebook, but how do you actually identify the people that will be easier to identify in a trade show, right? Because they're walking around the hall. Now you have to identify them in a in 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 a in yeah. a site space, in yeah. a virtual space. So so uh, that's a challenge for some organizations. Yeah. Also, seeing some organizations that have done a lot of work on it in the last couple of years that are really um, really winning that game. So uh, yeah. that's we use, um, we use LinkedIn and we use Twitter. Yes. And the two are completely different in the the way they work and the sort of profile that that you get. I mean, we we um yeah, they're, they're very different. Uh, LinkedIn, I think there's a there's a there's a challenge in using LinkedIn as a corporate marketing tool because LinkedIn was really built as a career development concept, and it's about individuals. Um, further in their career, finding new jobs and things like that. That was what it was originally set up for. And we, we use it from a, co a corporate perspective. Um, we have a, an AMI LinkedIn um, yes. um, activity, but we tend to use LinkedIn magazine-wise, we tend to use it more as individuals. So, you know, I, I put information on LinkedIn, my editorial colleagues put information on LinkedIn, but it, it's it's sort of done more on a sort of, um, uh, I wouldn't say face-to-face, because -face, obviously it's not face-to-face, -face, but there's a face to the message. 
and and you're communicating with other people rather than with organizations um, and when you look at what we do on twitter i mean we've we've been on twitter now for uh, nine years i think May no 11 years sorry 11 years 11 <laughs> years on twitter and we are with with we're the most followed plastics sort of news site but when i when you analyze the followers we have a very very high proportion of people who follow us only because of our coverage of things to do with recyclability environment so you'd say mainstream people some of which are very hostile to plastics actually but they still follow us um just because they want to know what's going on but two very different profiles and on, on twitter uh, we, we use the handle plastics world but on on twitter we're sort of invisible as people if you see what one you know we're just a we're just a handle um yes. uh, whereas on linkedin we're people if you see what if you see the yes, I, I completely see what, what what you mean what we have seen though is that in the last couple of months because people are behind the screens often at home um they are much more open to um um having a conversation on LinkedIn and, and being able to put a virtual conversation into their uh, uh, into their agenda as individuals. Uh, but mm. of course, they are coming for a company and they, they have an interest in getting information from other people. It's easier when all your day is in front of the computer and instead of a day being in meeting rooms in, in your organizations. We're also seeing uh, Twitter still uh, still going strong, especially in some countries. And if I may make a little uh, look over to uh, to Asia, WeChat um, organizations has has really boomed in the last couple of months and taken the place of some of the major uh, uh, major trade shows in China. So that's a that's an interesting development uh, mm. to follow. So for us, I think it's not one or the other. It is you need to go where your audiences um, are and you need to go and be able to identify those audiences, wh which is what you are seeing on, on, on Twitter, even yeah. if uh, it might be uh, people that are not well, necessarily positive. I think as well, we're, particularly with LinkedIn and WeChat as, as well, which is again a personal thing, you, to use it effectively, I think you you need to have the confidence to let your employees represent you if you like indirectly on there and and that does that does entail confidence uh, and it also does mean explaining to them what is not really suitable to be <laughs> to be put on <laughs> to LinkedIn um, because you know whenever you might put on your List in my personal views, not my corporations or whatever. But you know that doesn't really stack up. You know, if you're an employee of ABC Corporation and you put something on LinkedIn, that inevitably reflects on ABC Corporation. So you, but you do have to have the comp, you know, the confidence in your employees to allow them to to effectively use LinkedIn. I think, but also help them how to do it. Um, mm. Uh, not everybody understands what can be seen, what can't be seen. Yeah. So, and and we have I definitely seen that a lot. Sorry. I think I think on the web it's best to assume that everything can be seen. <laughs> I, you should always assume things can be on a, on the front page somewhere, right? I think so. So uh, looking into the crystal ball, um, we we're looking at uh, talking to organizations that are saying, let's see if trade shows come back, let's see if uh, if we go back to normal or uh, whatever you wanna call it. But um, looking at trade shows maybe nine months from now, um, what do you think they will look like? You were talking about the big ones might not happen, the smaller ones might be uh, more, um, uh, more possible to happen but do you think they'll be in the same shape as before that's uh that's a very difficult one to to um that's a very difficult one to answer i mean obviously i'm I, gonna come back and, said, uh, and hang you on it so <laughs> as i i mean we organize trade shows as well so you know we have a vested interest uh, I, um 
in in them being successful we get a, get a lot of news from trade shows we do a lot of business at trade shows you know we we um whether it's whether it's the small focus type things that we have been running or the big events like the k plastics fair that takes place in germany you know i mean whether it's the 5,000 attendee events or the quarter of a million attendee events, you know, they're all important to the way that people do business. And I, I think that although, you know, you can have, a, you know, there will, virtual, virtual is going to be with us. Um, you know, it's going to stay with us. The, the new normal will be normal, but it won't be like the old normal. <laughs> it will just be the new normal. Um, we'll have, um, I think we'll have we'll still have trade shows, um, and the the more as I said, the bigger they are, the more difficult it is to handle. But one, of, you know, you know, we don't really know what will happen with the pandemic, whether there'll be uh, you know vaccines, effective vaccines found, whatever. It's difficult to predict. But I think you know the the whole air, the whole focus is on whether you can maintain acceptable distancing, and if that can be achieved. I think. Probably in the shorter term, you know, it's going to feel very, very strange to go to these events. But then it go, it feels strange to go to a shop with a face mask <laughs> on, you know, uh, and yet it's becoming normal now. So uh, new normal. So so yeah, I think I, I think trade shows will will um, run. Some will, some won't. Some will be delayed again. Some will be different. Uh, it will just be adapting to the. To the circumstances and at the end of the day i guess the the authorities in the particular area that the show is going to be run will take the decision on whether or not acceptable uh, measures are put in place and then it will be down to the uh, visitors i mean there, there there is obviously you have to persuade visitors that the processes are in part in place as well and you know yes. we'll I think that again becomes an issue of the more you're expecting to be there, the more you're going to wonder whether it's a smart move. You know, if it's a small show, if it's a conference, if it's a quarter of a million people all in one city, then it might be a little bit different. So it might take longer before we're there. Do you think um so do you think that we're gonna have kind of hybrid trade shows where some people will, because of distance or rules, some people will be able to travel in, other people will or other people will be able to look at it from home, for example, to the keynote sessions or set up virtual meetings with uh, with companies? Do you think that will be a model? Um it well it it could be. I I think if I think the thing that is it will it will probably be a new model. Um, it will probably be a new thing. I don't, I don't think, I mean, it, you know, taking something like the K-Fair, for instance, I, I don't think you could take the K-Fair and turn that into a virtual fair and get the same result. You know, you, you could turn it in, you could take parts of it and do something differently. You could bolt parts of it on to the fair. So, I mean, at the moment, the, the the really big trade shows are very much an air, a, a, a sort of a, a you turn up, you've got your little list of companies that you want to see. You maybe made a few appointments and you walk around and whatever. You can you can see perhaps a more tighter integration of a virtual into that real um, environment. But I think it will be more of a it will be more of an, an add on to the event rather than a separate. Uh, a separate event, I think, and you'll probably see that across everything from conferences right the way through smaller shows, right up to bigger shows. You'll just see one of the things that one of the things that will come out of the current situation is that with more people doing what we're doing now, uh, communicating over the over the web, it will be more familiar. Um, people yes. will will not think it's strange. I, I mean, I, I know that. When we've looked at virtual events in the past, the the whole thing is, um, oh, I don't really know if I want to do that. I mean, it, it was the same when we when we launched our digital magazines. Although exactly. there were a lot of people that were quite happy to go digital. I mean, one of the things that we heard so often was people would say, 
I don't really like these digital magazines. I prefer a print one, but I do realise it's the way it's going. And there was that sort of reluctance. But of course, once it's effectively been forced upon you, you get the familiarity with it. And, you know, people won't sort of say, well, I can travel now, so I'm going to throw away my laptop. I won't need my webcam anymore. You know, that that's not that's not going to happen. I uh, know that's not the reality. No, I think we, we we see this acceleration in user adoption, right? That uh, that things that would maybe have been co felt complex before now seems uh, um, pretty normal and, and easy to do, um, depending on uh, no matter where you are, actually. Um, I was wondering, Robin, do we have any questions from uh, the audience? We do indeed. Uh, plenty of questions coming in. Um, so I think maybe one, just because um, Chris spoke about this issue quite a bit himself, I think maybe Ricky could answer this one. Um, it's a question from Marie. She asks, um, how do you see the future of events like international trade fairs? And do you think that to a certain extent they could be replaced by digital events or webinars? So I, I have to agree with, uh, with Chris. I don't think trade shows as such will be replaced. And, and I think we have seen that in a lot of experience from also the B2C industries, um, that often digital doesn't replace, but it becomes a new way. I can see trade shows where, um, where uh, part of the content um, and conferences where part of the content will open up to people that are not at the at the show, but they can uh, get in there virtually. I can also see that you can maybe meet um, virtually, uh, but I don't think we'll have a, a complete topsy turvy over on the other other side. I can also see that we'll see um, uh, companies and uh, publishers like AMI do more of a on demand pieces where where you can get the content when it fits you, that the content is there and you can go in and uh, watch it a little bit like uh, um, uh, like what we see on the on-demand uh, movie channels, for example. Um, I can see that being part of the content landscape, uh, but I think we have also all learned that though this is fun, and I talked to Chris, I've talked to him a couple of times this week. Um, I still would like to, uh, to to have a face to face with Chris, right? Because that's a uh, that this world doesn't uh, replace it completely. So that's what we are seeing, at least that uh, that certain things will come back, but they will be in a different way. And I think we have learned a lot from this period, and uh, and will continue to. We're also seeing, by the way, that. Uh, that a lot of more face-to-face -face meetings happens like like this, not just because of the pandemic, but because you don't have to wait with having the face-to-face -face meeting till you actually come into the same location. You can actually quicker uh, get to know who is the other one uh, the, on the other side of uh, or at that company. So uh, that's uh, that's my perspective for it. Very good. And um, Brigitte actually raises an interesting point here as a follow-up question, which I think maybe both of you could answer. And it's, uh, will companies really shy away from trade show participation or a visit because it takes up a lot of cost, I guess, together with the uh, the risks involved? What about the cost issue and the return on investment? I can give my, 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 uh, uh, my guess on it. I think it's going to, again, just look different. Um, I think some companies are going to say we're going to get our uh, some of our best people there, but if any of the sessions can be uh, done from the office, um, then some people that might not be as essential for the face-to-face -face will do it from the office. Um, I think we're going to see companies short-term maybe shy a little bit away from uh, from participating, but we're also seeing companies uh, saying, well, we, we really want to support the trade shows because they are so important for the industry um, that we're going to spend the money that it that it does cost because we have we don't have something that's as effective to replace it with. I don't Would know you about anything to add to that, Chris. Um, not really, no, not really. I mean, I, I think trade shows are very important. They, as we, you know, we spoke, we spoke, uh, I spoke earlier about, you know, the the like the print display act which doesn't give leads and the digital one that does give leads you know trade shows are the same are very similar in that they deliver a value that you can't necessarily get by other means and so i think people will want to in, in keep that integrated within their business i think what we've seen probably over you know 
the time that I let's just put it the, the long time that I've been in this uh, in in this business is it, we've just seen more and more and more options become available to people to connect with customers. So um, I, I don't really think that trade shows will be abandoned because of cost. Although you know experience has shown that through every recession, and obviously this is a different recession from previous ones that any of us have experienced, but through every recession people come back with slightly different budget plans and they may, you know they may need to look at smaller budgets but you know sometimes those smaller budgets become more focused budgets and um, you know so it, it, it's sometimes people can actually you know win out of the, that, that situation if they're offering something that's better value um, I don't know. You know, it's, it's, it, who can? We, we, it, it is difficult to predict, but I'd, I'd be very, very surprised if trade shows disappeared. What about from a journalistic standpoint, though? Would you, as a, what, do you, what are your expectations about journalists returning to trade shows? I mean, is it still really the, the key? Is it, is it worth the risk from from that perspective? Uh, <laughs> um, you know, is it worth the risk? Uh, Hopefully, if a journalist goes to a trade show, they're not putting their life on the line or anything. You know, <laughs> uh, you know I don't think we, you know, we would put ourselves as any braver than anybody else in that respect. Um, I think that trade shows, though, for a for a business such as ours, they're a very very efficient way of us meeting people that we need to have some form of relationship with if we're going to do our job. So they're they're very efficient. They're very effective. Um, in two or three days, we can make and renew contacts with people that um, would take, um, you know, weeks and weeks otherwise. Um, and we can update on what's going on. We get lots of material. So there's a big attraction for us to, to be at um, trade shows. And obviously, there are our colleagues on the, uh, the other side of the fence, should we say, who sell advertising and all the other sorts of things, they're highly valuable to them as well. So, yeah, I mean, they're, they're, we've got a good reason to be there and we would probably still be there and we would just be like everybody else. We would just assess whether we think it's uh, suitable measures have been put in place. <clears throat> Very good. Yeah, so thanks for that, uh, Robin. I mean, what we're also seeing is both on the journalist side and uh, from the organization side, uh, the virtual press briefings work really, really well um, right now, um, especially for product launches, to be able to actually explain in a forum like this what the products do. But we also know that for certain products, you need to, to actually see it in person. And we also spoke about that, uh, uh, Chris. Um, and, uh, and, and therefore, I think you'll see, again, a hybrid where some briefings will be happening virtually, maybe before show, and then uh, a more in-depth discussion with journalists uh, at a trade show um, um, as they start coming back. I, I think one of the, just to add to that, one of the, one of the challenges that, are, and this is the same if you're dealing with journalists or if you're dealing with customers or whatever, is that um, if you arrange a face-to-face -face meeting with somebody, if you go to their premises or whatever, um, you've arranged 35, 40 minutes of their time, and you have 35 or 40 minutes of their time, but when you arrange something virtually, you may think you've got 30 minutes of their time, <clears throat> but may, they may never join you. Uh, or they get a telephone call in the middle of it or an email or whatever, and they've gone. Um, I mean, the, 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 the bit of advice <laughs> someone gave me about anything virtual and digital is that you should always remember that anything else is one mouse click away. So yes. it's very easy to lose people. So. <clears throat> You need to take so, that into account. It raises an interesting question here from Laura, I think, too, to follow up on that, uh, Chris. It's um, how do you choose then to find the right audience when you're going to organize a webinar? So I guess, how do you ensure that this one is more likely to be engaged? So how do you choose the audience? Or how yeah, how do you choose the right audience when you're organizing a webinar? <clears throat> well, I mean, obviously, how you choose the audience doesn't really, um, that's not really changed from, 
how you would promote anything. I mean, you need either you need to have the people in your own databases and have the permission to be able to contact them about it, which is obviously an issue now with um, you know, GDPR in Europe and things. Mm -hmm. um, but <clears throat> I would say that you know you're in the same position that you that people have always been in, which is you have to go to you have to go to organisations that. Um, research this data. I mean, we would say we're one. There are other other organizations, but you know, the, any for any um, publishing company, you know, the, the core of our business is is the data that we that, that we hold. So, you know, if you yeah. think that you can just put some ads on um, Facebook or a few tweets on uh, a few posts on LinkedIn and deliver the right audience, then you're probably going to be disappointed you may get part of the audience but you know you, you just you need to work with people who have a, have access to the the types of person that you want to reach but for example Virla was asking uh, like which channels are you using yourself to promote the event that you have the plastics and the pandemic that you were mentioning earlier in your talk how are you promoting that it's a that's a good one we're using predominantly the biggest uh, the biggest number of people that will uh, that will register and it's it's been it's going very well at the moment but the, the the biggest number are coming from our own direct emails from our own databases but we're also using linkedin um we're using um twitter we're promoting in our magazines you know we're, we, we're using all the things that everybody else would use but the core of our reach if you like is from our uh from our email uh, not email from our databases our databases are more than email but from our databases so the information that we hold Robin, sort of, if, I, if i can uh, if i can add to that um yeah. i think um what what's very interesting for example about the the event that that chris is mentioning is it's really about having the right subject and getting that in front of the right audiences we are mm -hmm. seeing that a mix between, yes, you can do uh, advertising that's going to give you the awareness. Um, and actually, on, on some of these platforms, it's it's advertising that you can do very, very targeted. Um, uh, but we're also seeing that databases work very well. But most of all, as it always is, personal invitations work very well. So knowing your audiences and already having a uh, some kind of relationship uh, with your leads uh, really, really helps. Um, so I would say right. if one channel, it has to be a myriad of channels. That Very is good. one of the um, strengths of LinkedIn, of course, is the fact that you may reach out to one person or to 10 people that you know, and that can, you know, that it's like a spider web. If yes. they think it's of interest, they'll pass it, you know, they'll share it and whatever. But even even so, if for, for our business, I think we would say that the bulk of our um, response comes from the, the direct the direct connection. Very good. And um, I have time for a couple of questions left. I think this is a bit of a devil's advocate question here from, from Stephanie and again for Chris. Um, are editors going to lose their power as uh, as corporations start publishing their content themselves and really addressing customers directly? Well, that's, a, that's, a very, that's a very, very good one. And of course we won't because we're the most powerful people on the planet. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know. I mean, it's one of the things that we're seeing with social media at the moment, because uh, you know, basically everybody is a, a is an, a, an opinion writer on on social media. Um, I think um, the ten. I don't know. Will we lose? A, I don't think that. Well, I, firstly, <laughs> despite what I just said, I don't think we really have any power. Particularly, we have a little bit of influence, maybe, but we don't really have any power. But I think um, we are going through, just not in that this isn't in trade, but, you know, this is just in publishing altogether. Yes. We're going through a period of um, confusion, should we say. And if you look back, you know, 15 years ago, if you heard or read or saw a piece of news, the likelihood was that it had been put there by somebody who had done at least some basic research and it was 
probably relatively um, informed. Whereas now you get distorted videos, you get fake news, and you know we part of what I do. Um, part of what I do is try to counter some of the uh, of the anti-plastic fake news that you um, you know that you get out there. You know your average person eats 40 kilos of plastic a day or something in an apple or whatever, uh, and people just believe it. Um, but part of what we do is to try to counter that. But you know, you see very, very quickly if you're getting involved in this that fake news travels faster and farther than real than facts do. Um, so I don't know really. I mean, there are some signs that, that social media companies are starting to take a slightly different view on fake news, but I'm not sure how well that will stick. I mean, one of the big one of the big problems is the the imbalance, I guess, between publishers such as ourselves and Facebook. Whereas, you know, Facebook says we're not responsible for the content that people put on Facebook. We're just the channel where we can't say that. Um, everything that we publish in our digital magazines, we're responsible for. So there is a there is a big difference. Um, and I think it is starting to approach a time where there will be a crunch, I think, and regulators will start to get a little bit more, I don't know, there will be more regulation of what's on the web, yeah. I think. Very good. I would though not say that that the content that companies are publishing is necessarily fake news. Um, no. I think what's really important is that organizations um, continue to have uh, content out there that that is well researched and and that can be trusted and especially in in organizations that uh, that want to be um uh, shining lights in their industry uh they they have to be authentic they have to be um documented and factual um otherwise uh, that's not a game you should play yeah i think that's the, the key trust i think is the is the thing and i, I yes. think what we had you know, in the pre-social media world is that there were, you could easily make a judgment of trust on where information was coming from. It's not so easy now to make a, make a, <laughs> a, a judgment of trust. And companies also need to be aware of that. They need to make sure that, you know, it is difficult because, you know, it is difficult when we, when we as a business get in, um, you know, putting out comments on the plastics world, for instance, when we put out comments on there or counter claims that are being made, we have to be very, very aware that if we say this isn't the case, this is the fact, well, that has to be the fact. We can't, you know, and if we can't justify the fact, then we can't really say it, so. No. Well, I think we are just about out of time. So I definitely, from my side, want to say thank you, Chris, uh, for taking this hour with us. Um, uh, it was, as I expected, uh, very inspiring and, and very, very interesting. Um, Robin, do you wanna uh, do you wanna close us off? Yeah, I can close us off. Um, yeah, thank thank you all. Thank you all for for joining us today. Um, so just to let you know that we'll be emailing a link of this chat later at this week to all attendees, so you can watch it back again. And um, of course, feel free to connect with uh, Chris, Rick, or myself via LinkedIn. And um, with that, thank you and have a wonderful day. And thanks very much, Chris. Yeah, thanks for asking me to join. Bye. Okay.